This week, we are joined by not one, but two astronauts as we speak to Mike Massimino and Garrett Weissman about their brand new podcast, Two Funny Astronauts. Yes, a little bit of crod podination, as I like to call it. They don't claim to be funny, but they do claim to be funny for astronauts. I am very excited to be talking to them both. Plus, we'll have our roundup of all the news from the world of spaceflight. Thanks to all who got in contact with us last week to say how much they enjoyed our interview with Jerry Griffin. Please do keep getting in touch with your thoughts and ideas, but right now, please enjoy episode 39 of the Space and Things podcast. Oh my God. Listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I am Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 39 of our podcast. Hey, Emily, I don't know about you, I'm buzzing because we've just recorded this interview and it was amazing. Uh, but before we get on to that, you also went to Kennedy Space Center this weekend. So this must have been just a, such a great time right now, isn't it? Yes. Uh, to celebrate having enough antibodies after the COVID vaccine, I went to KSC for the first time. I had not been to Kennedy Space Center in like over two years i hadn't seen the uh, apollo 11 the statues yeah nice aren't they i hadn't seen the delta 2 yet there there was so much that i just had not seen yet at the apollo saturn 5 center they have a uh, holograms now of uh charlie yeah. duke jim lovell and al warden which was kind of surreal to see it was wonderful it was like meeting an old friend again and uh, just a wonderful weekend and we me and some friends met up at zarella's just like the good old days so Things are starting, I don't know if they're back to normal, but things are starting to go that direction. So happy times are coming back and I just, I feel a lot more positive. That's all I have to say. It was, it was a lot of fun. I know what you mean, because I had my first pub gig on Saturday since March 2020 when I used to do five or six of these a week. So uh, yeah, I, I kind of feel like my, my, uh, my day jobs, I'm getting it back part time, which it's a nice feeling just that the the world is beginning to head back into somewhere that I remember and loved. And it was so much fun. I was oddly emotional playing playing some songs. But yeah, yeah, the, the best time. So obviously, I want to hear all about Kennedy Space Center. And I was, I've been there, so I've got my own thoughts about this. So how about next week we do a show about Kennedy Space Center, a kind of uh, visitor's guide or a top tips kind of episode. And, and uh, listeners, if you have been yourself and you have anything that you'd like to contribute to that, please do get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to talk about Kennedy Space Center, uh, maybe some things in the area that you might want to see as well. Uh, Brevard County in Florida, there's just so much. I mean, it, it is like it is if you are a space freak it is like heaven so you have to go see it and we'll give you the best sort of uh to, i guess the tourist guide of what you have to see if you're there yeah absolutely anyway we got a lot to do today so uh let's crack on yes let's crack on okay we're off to a good start play it cool so today's episode all came together really quickly and we're very happy about that Retired space shuttle astronauts Mike Massimino and Garrett Reisman have started a brand new podcast called Two Funny Astronauts. Uh, we've both been listening and it's a lot of fun. So we sent them a message to see if they'd like to join us for an episode of Space and Things. And we got a yes straight away, which is crazy. So uh, here we are. Mike Massimino was in the 16th class of NASA astronauts and was chosen in 1996. He had two missions, both servicing the Hubble Space Telescope. And Garrett Reisman was in the 17th class of astronauts, selected in 1998, and also had two missions to space, although his missions were just on the International Space Station. Uh, <laughs> that's probably enough for now as we'll find out much more in this interview with two funny astronauts Anybody home? so welcome astronaut mike massimino one of the last people to touch the hubble space telescope the first person to tweet from space you'll have seen him on so many documentaries and films a true legends and welcome to hang on a moment um i've written it down here somewhere oh, oh here it is um G garrett Gar Garrett Reisman? No, oh no, no, Reisman. Reisman, sorry about that. Uh, Why I, did they always I, pick on I, me? I don't I seem to have anything written here about you. Uh, yeah. So, well, I can fill you in. <laughs> <laughs> Garrett, um, 
Have, have you been to space? Yes, I've been to space. <laughs> How many times? <laughs> so look like the kind of guy that keeps the, 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 the keeps track. I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, in all seriousness, Garrett, it's a pleasure to have you with us. I obviously was making reference to some of the stories in the first episode of your new podcast, which uh, I've enjoyed very much so far. So uh, what made the two of you decide to start a podcast? Uh, well, uh, Garen and I have been, uh, uh, good friends for a very long, great friends for a long time. And we cracked each other up when we were in the astronaut office. And since we left the astronaut office, we continue to crack each other up. And so we, we figured this made sense to try to do something together. We had, uh, we also enjoy the, uh, the outreach, the engagement with, um, uh, with the public and talking about our experiences as astronauts and, uh, we've looked at doing TV shows and we've done some t- television work together and, uh, we thought, well, Hey, you know, let's, let, let's, let's think about a podcast and talk to some of our other friends uh, who are already doing them uh, and, and the Hollywood types that are doing this stuff and figured, well, maybe we can do this. So, so that's how it happened. But Garrett's got a much funnier version of it. Uh, don't put all the pressure on me, man. I don't, I don't work well on <laughs> the pressure. Says the astronaut. <laughs> Says one of the nation's top rocket scientists. Yeah, no, what we do is definitely not rocket science on this on this <laughs> podcast, no, that's for sure. But um, we have a lot of fun, and we always had a lot of fun together, and every time we get together, we crack each other up. So we figured that we would have a good time doing this thing. We were looking for a project to do together. We, th- we talked to a bunch of reality TV production companies and and out in Hollywood, and uh, nothing really seemed to be a good fit. And then we just said, you know, let's just do it ourselves and have a good time, do it our, our, our what we want to do. And it's kind of like, you know how like Jerry Seinfeld has his Comedians of Cars getting a coffee show where he's obviously just hanging out with his friends and having a good time and doing what he loves doing. Yeah. And and that's, it was, why don't we just do something that we really enjoy? Maybe somebody will listen, maybe not, but we'll have a good time, you know? So uh, that's, that's kind of how we ended up here. Okay. <laughs> I have listened to the show and I really enjoy it. I hope my questions don't come across as insulting. You listen to the show? Yes, I do listen to You're the, the show. You're the one. Garrett, we found her. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're one of the like first five subscribers, don't you get a t shirt? <laughs> I I don't know. I'll take well, a t shirt. Let's see. The five subscribers were Garrett, me and you. Yeah. Your mom. Yeah. And our significant others. So I think that's, we know where those shirts are going. So that's, that sounds a lot like our podcast as well, except, <laughs> yeah. that, you know, for some reason Garrett's mom ended up as our first subscriber. And I don't know how that happened. <laughs> and she really appreciates the t shirt too. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> okay. Um, I have listened to the show. And does the show really have a plot? Are you guys, are you guys going <laughs> to, because you guys kind of just go back and forth and tell stories. Man, it's a plot. That might that might be a good idea. Maybe we should <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I feel like I'm back in ninth grade English. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you wrote here, uh, Mike, but it doesn't have it doesn't make any sense. Oh that boy, I think I made him mad. Okay, I think I made him mad. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we should we should try to answer that though. Garrett, what's the story? <laughs> All right, okay. So, so what we do is we we do uh, believe it or not. I know it might not sound <laughs> like we do, but we actually do. Before we record an episode, we come up with like at least a topic. It might be like survival training, or yeah. um, or like doing a spacewalk uh, on Hubble versus doing a spacewalk on space. So we'll have some general idea. But we try, like, we, we, we did a couple where we, like, went through detail and we told the stories to each other. And then we did the recording and it didn't come out as natural. We found that if we just surprise each other and play off of each other, it comes out much more funny. So we just come up with a, a general a, a topic so that we have something to start with. And then we just riff on that. And that's kind of how we do it. That was a good answer. Just try, we just try to just tell stories to each other and. And hopefully entertain and have people learn uh, while they're laughing um, uh, something about the space program. And so it does have it does have I think that message there. But uh, it's it's a it's a way to to show us uh, you know what it was really like kind of behind the scenes. And and we do we do talk as Garrett said yeah we 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 do structure it a little bit. And and should we expect some special guests coming up at any point, or is it just going to remain the two of you? Oh yeah, my my mom is coming on. Excellent, great. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> No, yeah, we, we we will be doing that. Uh, we at the first the we we didn't really know how many we would just do. Garrett and I, we did a bunch. Uh, we've recorded a bunch. We've 
got them in the can, so to speak. But uh, we also want to bring in some of our friends and some other people from the science community and from Hollywood and other places. Um, we've only recorded one so far, one of our crewmates, uh, for both Garrett and I, uh, has come, others have agreed to do it. And we've reached out to some significant people in the, in the science community who are interested to coming in. So, uh, so far we have, uh, we've had one guest recorded, but you know, hopefully we're going to, we're going to get a lot more, uh, in there as well. We just, just to get, it's, it's really just conversational trying to get different stories out there, um, different experiences that we've had and others have had and how they're kind of interrelated. Yeah. You know, so the title of our podcast is two funny astronauts and we're not saying that, that we're the only two funny astronauts. It's like, <laughs> we are two funny astronauts, but there are other yeah. funny astronauts. And so right. uh, we're going to invite the other funny astronauts and maybe some that are just a little bit funny, you know, <laughs> 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 to join us from time to time and share their stories. But we also want to branch out. Like Mike said, we want to branch out and, I would love to have some stand-up comics on the show. I would love to have um, some actors and some people from from entertainment industry that that could share, and and maybe some athletes. I would love to have some ball players on 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 our podcast, to because there's a lot of interesting similarities. I mean, we talk about like doing a spacewalk, and what you goes through your head right before you go out that airlock, and compare it to like what goes through an athlete's head as they're about to take the field for a championship, like a World Series or a Super Bowl. So it, it's kind of similar. Yeah. Um, except there's a, a lot less money at stake when you're doing the spacewalk. <laughs> but, <laughs> Depends how you look at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The space station wasn't cheap, you know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good point. Not your money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Speaking of funny astronauts, uh, you guys talked a lot in the first episodes about uh, John Young, which was mm. delightful because uh, he's one of definitely one of my favorite uh, astronauts. He he kind of did everything. I hate saying this. You guys kind of made him sound a little like a psycho. <laughs> like, a hey, psycho. wait a minute. Those are your no. words. We never said that. They did not say this. Those are my <laughs> words. But no, the part where he does the landing with no visibility, I'm like, oh, what? I, I, I don't know what I would have uh, done had I been in that. Had I been in that <laughs> T-38, probably wet my pants. Um, anyway, this is why I'm not an astronaut. So that <laughs> happened with me and I was sitting in his back seat. And when when we were trying to land there in in New Orleans, and you have to understand that that whole story that I told it took place in like a a, a couple seconds, you know. Oh wow! Okay. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a uh, it was everything was fine until we got very close to the ground, what we called the landing flare, right before the main gear touched down and you land. It was right then that everything just went white. It all of a sudden we just lost all visibility because of a, a low layer of fog that we couldn't see from up above. But when we got in it, everything just vanished. Okay. Oh my God. And so yeah. he, you know, he kept his cool and did a great job with that landing. I didn't mean to make him sound like a psycho. <laughs> if anybody was panicking, it was me. I was reaching <laughs> for the ejection seat handles. He was still holding on to the stick flying the airplane, which is the right thing to do. So that's no there's no knock on him. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> I love the John Young stories personally. I like the stories where uh, you were like, "Dude, tell him you were a moonwalker," and he's like, "No, I'm not gonna do that." You know, <laughs> I love that too because I was like, I would have been like, "Dude, yeah. just tell him you walked on the moon." And a good stuff. life lesson: don't ever try to impress anyone. It'll just make it worse. <laughs> yes, who had a wait? We had a moonwalker wait here last week. We don't get everyone in the front of the line. That's, yeah, that's what would have happened. It would have backfired. What gets me is, I mean. Nobody had a clue who this guy was. You know, I know he was in, you know, in his 70s, but I'm like, how? Would, I don't know. Well, he was he was very, you know, he was not a guy who would go around. He was, very, you know, very, um, what's the right word? You know, he, he, he didn't he didn't use his persona, who he was to try to take any advantage of anything. You know, he was just who he was, very inconspicuous, I guess, just a regular person, not you know, trying to He was a pilot trying to get off the ground that he wasn't you know, this American hero, as we know him. And, yeah. you know, you wouldn't know by looking at him. There's when he, uh, we've, we've told a bunch of stories, but I remember at his retirement ceremony, did you go to that Garrett? Do you remember going to that? They had it. Yeah. I think it was at space center Houston and someone, I think it was, uh, uh, Dana justice or someone was telling a story how he would, you know, they lived by him and you would see him wandering around just like in his shorts and, but he was just like a regular guy in the neighborhood and you wouldn't know who he was. You know, I heard a story, a similar story at, at Alan Bean's, uh, at Alan Bean's memorial, another moonwalker who died, 
that some of the, it was in Houston and some and some people showed up and they said they never knew who Alan was for a long time. He was a guy who used to go out and walk his dog, <laughs> and he became friends with his neighbors and you know, these kids. And you know, he never said, "Hey, I walked on the moon." He was just the 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 nice man who walked his dog who lived around the corner. And I think that kind of shows who those guys were. You know, they did extraordinary things, but they were just regular people. You run into them on the street, you wouldn't you would not think, you know, oh, this this guy is just something special until you maybe found out later then you realize yeah this was a special person yeah I, I, i've enjoyed the story so far about how you both became astronauts and and the process um uh, you know including an interview with john young which is which is crazy um obviously that was that was in the mid 90s was was there anyone else left around from the apollo era at that point in nasa or was john the the last remaining one he was a, the last one that was still an active astronaut uh and still coming to our weekly Monday morning meetings and all that kind of stuff. We would see some of the other Apollo guys from time to time, especially at reunions or when they came by for their physicals and stuff. So we would see Neil Armstrong and, um, you know, um, all, 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 a whole bunch of the Apollo guys would, would stop by, but, but nobody was there on a day-to-day -day basis other than John. But we, we were kind of lucky, Gary. I guess we talked a little bit about maybe during a podcast, but when we came in uh, to the I would, late 90s, both of us, 96 for me, 98 for Garrett and his class, uh, those got, you know, this was what, 30, how many years after Apollo? 30? So they were still in pretty good shape, most of them. These guys were in their 60s, you know, maybe mid, late 60s to mid 70s. And so even like Gene Kranz, would, he wasn't, he was retired by then, but Gene Kranz came and spoke to our astronaut class, as that I mentioned, Alan Bean and Neil Armstrong. And of course, mm. John was there all the time. But every once in a while, you'd run into Jim Lovell or you know, those, they were around, you know. So, so we were really lucky. I think even though none of those guys were really active except for John, they were still in pretty good shape and, and, uh, and able to come and, and, and tell us stories and their, you know, share their knowledge and experiences with us. And we got to become friends with them, which was just great. But actually, there's one more that I that I, I can't mm. believe I forgot that, that that we should mention, which is that uh, John Glenn. Mm. So yeah, uh, that's course. Course. yes, yeah, exactly. Course. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, when and that was uh, that was just in the beginning when I first showed up. It was right when he also started training for his second <laughs> yep. flight, which is his flight that's on the, crazy on the shuttle. And I remember being introduced to him at so so I had this truck <laughs> when I first get and it was my only vehicle. I had to drive in and it was a 1975 international scout and with black interior. Okay. And I'm driving it in Houston in the summer with no air conditioning. <laughs> all right. Oh wow! And so I'm in like my tie and jacket and stuff and I'm driving to this reunion banquet and I'm dripping with sweat, just <laughs> completely covered in sweat. And I walk in, I'm looking like, like a drowned rat or something. And, and Scott Parazinski brings me over at this at, to one of his crewmates i want you to introduce one of my crewmates this is senator john glenn i looked at him and i just said i'm sorry i'm sorry uh, who <laughs> 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 and he gave me this look like I, I look terrible and i'm making this joke and, and he looks at me like who are these idiots we're hiring nowadays <laughs> you know? yeah. look, at, look at this scum are we are we ready to become astronauts we wouldn't day? have that in my day yeah <laughs> That's funny. Oh when it was yeah, Garrett's right. He was around, and it was it was really fun when he showed up. It was it was you know he's just hanging around with us in the locker room and you know over in the gym and and you know doing doing his job just like the rest of us were training for his flight. I got to be his family escort. I was uh, me and uh, Kent Rominger, Rommel, one of the other astronauts. We were family escort for that crew, so I got to know him and his family really well. And uh, he's one of those guys that really lived up to being a being a true American hero in in all the all the aspects of it, I thought. So, yeah, how do we? Good catch there, Garrett. Yeah. When you first joined, was it intimidating at all being around not just someone like John Glenn, but the more experienced astronauts? Were they on the whole very welcoming, or were was there a little bit of competition, or did they try and you know make it known that, that they'd been around a while and they knew the oh, stuff? It was terrifying, <laughs> especially the Canadians. <laughs> really? Wow. And Mark Arno. Oh, yeah. So mean. <laughs> there was uh I think it was it was they were everyone was very nice and they you know that you get you get picked and they're going to train you and you know they're going to help you as much as they can but there's also a fair amount of uh 
you know, good, good natured kidding and, and ribbing and, you know, and, you know, a lot of jokes. Chris Hadfield, you mentioned a Canadian astronaut. Chris Hadfield, uh, at the, at the first time, uh, the, our first kind of introduction sort of to the uh, office for my class, Garrett mentioned going to a reunion soon after he joined. And the same thing happened to us. We had, they had a, a national reunion our first week, uh, not just coincidentally, I think it was in the summer and that's when we started. But that Friday, uh, when, after we started, they had the, they had the reunion. And so a lot of these guys were back there. There was a big, big crowd of the, you know, the former astronauts and current astronauts and Chris Hadfield provided the entertainment. So Chris got pretty famous for, for singing in space. He did the David Bowie, uh, song in space. Uh, uh, what's the name of that song? Space Oddity, right? Yeah. That's what, yeah. yeah. Okay. So he did that song. So anyway, so, uh, so he entertained the, he, he was, you know, he was a very entertaining guy musically. So he would write parody songs and sing them to the office, uh, for different events. And he sang, uh, a song to us, like welcoming, welcoming us to the office. And more or less the theme was welcome to the office, but you'll never fly in space was the <laughs> kind of chorus of that. So, you know, you kind of got, it was, they were very welcoming and the serious part was they were getting us ready to fly in space and to follow on in that great tradition that we had in the astronaut office. But at the same time, you know, there was a good, good amount of uh, ribbing and kidding and picking on us. And so that, that it was a bit of that too, but all, all part of the, seriously, all part of the training process, all in building a camaraderie and, and friendship and, and uh, brother and sisterhood there to, to get the job done, I think. And uh, I don't know how it all worked out. But apparently it did somehow. But there was things, nothing was going right. You know, I remember from the beginning, nothing fit. We got that stuff, they got the geniuses figuring stuff out to like the nanometer, right? Or whatever, you know, the spot. And it's still not fitting. We're both trying stuff. I don't know what's going on out there, but somehow I think it all worked. You've talked about things like the Navy. I was in the Navy, so you've talked about really? the Navy. Yes, I was. A, I wasn't an officer. I was enlisted. Thank you for your service. Yeah, thank you. Th- thank you. Yeah, but the part with the Navy survival training cracked me up because <laughs> I had to go through something very similar, and I thought I was going to die because I was not a great swimmer. And all of a sudden, it's like they, I just got basically thrown into the water, and it was like, okay, now I float for a while. Like what? <laughs> Okay, so I'm like, I'm literally panicking and I'm like, uh, just try to float. Just try to. I did pass it, but it was like, I, I thought I was going to die because they're trying so, to kill you. So, Emily, if, if, you, if you know that you're not a good swimmer, why are you oh doing the Navy? Oh my God, I knew this was coming. <laughs> I was going to help those other services. How about the Air Force? Air Force. You, know, you know, maybe. Well, Mike's scared of heights and he became an astronaut, so. That's true. Mm-hmm. The Army, you know. You don't have to swim. Army has a lot of boats, though, too. <laughs> you know, I think the army. There's a. I don't. Know, the army guys would say. I don't know if this is true or, or accurate. It is like it must be. But they would say they had more boats than the navy and more aircraft than the air force. Gary, did you ever hear that? And those army guys make stuff up all the time. I don't know if I trust them. <laughs> someone, someone could fact check that one. You got those guys. Yeah. Yeah. This may not be accurate. Um, okay. This is what I wanted to know. You guys talked about all that stuff. And I thought it was really funny, especially the Navy survival training, because it was like they're basically trying to just kill everybody during that kind of stuff just to sort of make you, you know, learn well, how to survive. Well, I don't survive. think they were trying to kill us. I think, I think they, were trying to they kill didn't me. want to kill us because it'd be a lot of paperwork. <laughs> if they <laughs> killed right. a new astronaut, can you imagine? Like, hey, what happened? You know, you're just yeah. supposed to train these guys and be like, well, we killed them because, you know, we couldn't do it. Like, well, you know, there'd probably be a lot. Of, I think they were fearful of paperwork. <laughs> So they they weren't trying to they I think they really wanted us to survive because there'd be a lot of paperwork. I wasn't I an astronaut, so I don't think they cared. They were just like, <laughs> whatever, you're just expendable. That's maybe whether well, you're going in the Navy, like Garrett said, you know, they expected us with us. You know, NASA would say, Hey, what you do to the we expect you to get him back? You know, and there'd be a lot of paperwork. You have a point. Can we expect any okay. My question was before <laughs> before the, this went down such a slide. Um my question actually was, can we expect any more sort of, can you maybe give us a teaser or something about like some more sort of stories about, I guess, like sort of that indoctrination into that world? Because the rest of us who are kind of space nerds, you know, we always are like, oh, what's astronaut training like? That must be so cool. Can we expect any other things sort of like that? Oh, yeah. So the the next couple of episodes... Um are, uh, are, are we kind of go deeper into some of the survival because so, we have a we had a lot that we turned out we had a lot of survival training stories so we 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 did talk about the water survival with the navy but 
In uh, upcoming episodes, we're going to talk about uh, some of the cold weather survival training we do with the Canadians and with the Russians and water survival oh on the Black Sea with the Russians. <laughs> um, Knowles, this outdoor leadership school thing we did. Um, so there's a lot of this field training stuff that we'll be talking about in, in the near future. And then, you know, we got lots of different topics that are, are, are queued up. I think we're through like 13 episodes so far and we've still got a whole lot to get through. So nice. Uh, and, and it won't all be about um, flying in space or, or even or preparing to fly in space or training. Some of it would be like, we have a lot of stories to talk about, about baseball. Uh, and, and so we're going to be that we, we've already recorded one of those. We've got a lot more episodes that we could cover just about baseball and about like when you're an astronaut, you get to throw a first pitch, but that's like throwing a first pitch in the stadium. That's cool. 55,000. Yes, Dave. Thank, yes. I see. For those of you at home, Dave is putting on a New York Yankees cap. Oh, boy. <laughs> Take that, Massimino. <laughs> well, it's, it's only because I'm, I'm a Brit and, the, the, you know, it's the branding. We yeah. don't really know what's what it is. The we branding. Just see yeah, it. Don't it's get the too logo. excited about that yeah. one, Garrett. They don't know what he's got. <laughs> he thinks he's wearing something, you know, it's advertising New York City or something. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly yeah. what it was. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like kind of like rap stars. They, uh, yeah. You know, they're not really fans of the team necessarily. They're just representing the town, right? I don't even know why I have this hat, but it's, I have it. <laughs> it looks good on you, though, Dave. Thanks. Looks, Thanks. Looks I appreciate it. It looks pretty that. good. Yeah. Thank you. Talking of looking pretty good, actually, that was a really good segue. I should should bottle that one. Uh, talking of looking pretty good, I've seen you both in TV shows over the last year. Uh, <laughs> is that something you enjoy, or have you just fallen into that and, and it's a world you're just exploring? Well, the looking pretty good part, I guess we have to pay credit to the makeup artist. <laughs> All right. For me, anyway, Garrett. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and take that one, Garrett? I can answer as well, but why don't you go ahead? All right. It, well, yeah. So it's uh, the TV stuff uh, just kind of happened. The, the Colbert thing is it's a long story about how I ended up on the Colbert Report, and I could fill up all the remaining time. But it's a long story, but it was that was a lot of fun. I really, I really enjoyed that. The whole thing. It was um, the first interview we did in space was 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 really exciting, and and it came out okay. And then uh, coming back and being in the studio and going through that whole experience, getting like just kind of weird things that you never expect to have happen to you. Like being in a green room and getting like a bag of swag that you can't keep, by the way, you got to, you're a government employee, you got to turn that stuff in. But, uh, but it's like just having those experiences was pretty unusual, you know? So when you become an astronaut, you, you kind of expect that you're going to have these incredible life experiences, like launching on a rocket and doing a spacewalk maybe and stuff like that. You never think about all the other stuff that's going to happen, like throwing at a first pitch at Yankee stadium or like, being on, you know, in, in Mass's case, being on uh, uh, the Big Bang Theory, uh, you know, it, it, it's 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 uh, so the, this podcast that we're doing, we're going to explore all of that. Not only the things that you expected to have happen and the things that happen um, that, that when you become an astronaut that you see coming, but the things you don't see coming that are also crazy and super fun. Yeah, I know you you're on For All Mankind. You've actually guest starred on it, which is uh, really mm -hmm. awesome. We're we're both huge fans of For All Mankind. Oh, cool. Even though the last season was a little traumatizing, uh, I won't <laughs> mm. drop any spoilers for those people who haven't watched it. But yeah, anyway, um, I loved it, but I was not ready for any of it. Anyway, yeah. um, I, by the way, I I tried I lobbied against that. I the fir the first time I saw that script come through with that with that scene, I sent an email to uh, the executive producers and the showrunner. And I said. No, but <laughs> yeah, you know, Garrett, you know, Garrett is a technical consultant on that one. So you could all your critiques, you could go to him with, <laughs> he can do something about it. No, I, I loved it. I was just, I think everybody was doing that at the end of that episode. I, I, I was crying. Like I, like I freaking knew people on that show. Like they were actual yeah. people. And I was like, what is this? I've never had a reaction no. to this. Like a, on no. a show. I thought it was beautifully done, but still it was, yeah, it was, it was a little heavy anyway. Yeah. No, just, just to add, you know, Garrett, brought up a really good point. We haven't, I don't think we've had a, we haven't talked about this yet. Some of our Hollywood experiences, but uh, it is really is cool. And that's one of the things we're trying to get at all the different opportunities that you get as an astronaut. For me, the big bang theory <laughs> Uh, I got a call from NASA headquarters one afternoon, and they said, "Mike, do you know about the big the Big Bang Theory?" And I go, "Yeah, it was this big explosion." And, <laughs> you know, back the and they go, "No, the TV show." And I was like, "I think I've heard of it." And he goes, "Well, it's a very good show, and we like you. They're looking to speak to an astronaut. We, we, you know, if you're out in LA, stop by the writers' room." And I, I, I did that. I was my son was a water polo player. 
in high school and he, we would go to California every once in a while and he was out there and I stopped by the writer's room. A whole new world opened up to me with those when Chuck Lorre and the other writers were there. And uh, they just I was just telling stories like similar to what we've we've been doing today. And uh, I helped a little bit with the script and then they asked me to come back and do a cameo and that led to a bunch more. So, yeah, you never know. We, we, we were given a lot of great opportunities in space, but also a lot of fun stuff uh, in Hollywood and baseball that we've mentioned and that's we're hoping to share all those things with the uh, with the listeners as well. It's it is so much fun. Uh, I, I really enjoyed working on on this TV show, um, and I got to do some on camera stuff as you mentioned. But but most of the time I'm behind the scenes working with the writers and with the actors. Um, in fact, right before our podcast today, I got a call from Ren Schmidt who plays Margot Madison, and she had a question wow. about orbital uh, about uh, interplanetary trajectories because <laughs> she's really trying <laughs> oh. to get into her character. So I just I just finished talking to her just a, a little while ago, and and um, so I, I'm I'm loving it like because because I you know as a kid growing up and then I became went to school became an engineer I never expected as an engineer to end up sitting in a Hollywood writers room you know with professional writers and producers coming up with ideas for stories for a TV show and and what it feels like to me is it's kind of like I tell people it's kind of like when you go to fantasy baseball camp <laughs> and you pay a bunch of money and they like let you take batting practice with the Yankees and then they, they humor you and they come over and they pat you on the back like, Hey, good swing. You know, Aaron judge comes by and said, Oh, you really ripped one that, you know, that was a great cut. And, 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 you know, they're just like, they're just saying that because you paid a lot of money and they got to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's got, I kind of expect that one day Ron Moore, I expect him to come over, tap me on the shoulders. Like, okay, kid, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> wow. No, it's, it is uh, a really it's, good it's show. Kind of it's like, it's, it's kind of surreal. And uh, and whenever they actually like listen to something I, I offer up and it makes it into the show, it, it it's a great it, it's really a strange feeling. I remember sitting on the set next to one of the executive producers, um, Matt Wolpert, and and something that I had written like a bit, little bit of dialogue. One of the characters was saying in the scene, and he he just you know the character br- brings it to life on the set with all the props and the lighting and, the, and everything else. And I and I and I kind of got tingly, and I, and I said to him like, "You do this for a living. You do this all the time. You're a writer. Does does this ever get like normal?" And he's like, "No, <laughs> no, it's awesome. Every <laughs> every time it happens is like the best thing ever. So it's it's really cool." You know, out the window we can see many nations go by, but there's only one universe, and I'm here to tell you that it is a Yankee universe. And now. For a 17,500 mile per hour fastball. Go Yankees! So we've got some questions from our patrons, which we're going to go through now. Starting with this one from Amar, and I love this question. Have you or any of your peers ever pranked each other during your time at NASA, whether on Earth or in space? Now, obviously, I've seen the video of uh, Scott Uh-oh. Kelly getting in the gorilla suit and freaking out Tim, Tim Peake, but did anything any- like that happen on any of your missions? Yes. Do you want to share one first, Mike? No, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I was on I was on boring missions. Well, there was one while I was on the space station um, with um, our, our commander was Peggy Whitson and the other flight engineer is Yuri Malenchenko. And Yuri and I one day uh, decided we're going to mutiny. So somebody <laughs> in my family <laughs> sent up some inflatable like pirate cutlasses, some like swords. So wow. we, we inflated those things and we charged off at Peggy and we like tied her up with bungees and, and took over the ship. And then we radioed down to mission control in Houston and we had a list of demands if they want, uh, they, or, or we're going to make Peggy walk the plank out the airlock, right? If they don't satisfy our demands. So the first demand was, we are tired of flying this thing to the east. We want to turn this thing around. <laughs> <laughs> get a different view and fly the other way. Why go to the West? You know, why do we always have to go to the East? And then uh, I think the second thing was um, pizza. We want pizza. <laughs> we had no pizza. And then the third thing was when they bring up the new Japanese laboratory module, we wanted a hot tub in there. <laughs> so those were our demands. And Houston got right into the act and they said they were considering our demands and they, uh, <laughs> they, will, they uh, please don't hurt Peggy and, uh, and then the, they, of course, they looked at the at the calendar, and it was April first. So that's that was our April Fool's Day joke. Uh, nice. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have one uh, from from space that comes to mind here, but uh, 
Uh, I mean, thanks, Garrett, for telling your story first. It gave me a little time to think. <laughs> but during training, we were uh, on, on my on my second flight. Uh, I was standing next to one of the engineers who built the telescope. We were looking at the mock-up uh, before it went into water. And uh, there was a keel, a keel pin on the telescope. And when it was launched on in the shuttle, the keel pin uh, was in, you know, down in the payload bay. And it was there was a clamp that went over it to hold it in place, right? So, and then you released the clamp and other hold downs when the when the telescope was deployed. You know, uh, now back uh, how long? 30, 31 years ago now, believe it or not. So, anyway. I remember looking up up at the keel pin, uh, and the, this engineer said, "You know, Mike, the the version of that thing in space, you know, the the one on the Hubble is made out of gold." I'm like what? He goes, "Yeah, you know, they they wanted it for its, you know, its conductivity, its properties. They they decided to make that thing out of." I go, "Gold It's up there?" <laughs> and you know, it's what is it doing anything? He goes, "No, it was just used for the deploy." And, and, and I go, "I'm like, well, how's it held on?" And he, you know, he told me whatever it was a seventh eighth inch nut, and I go, "I'm gonna." We go get that thing. And we had just seen as a crew, we had just watched uh, one of the Oceans movies. You know, we really like the Oceans 11. I go, this is a caper. We're going to go get that thing. And so what, what we did was, is, uh, is my, my plan, we, you know, we, the plan was the next time we were in the water that I was going to go up to that keel pit. I was going to look for a time where, you know, I was going to shut off my camera and go no calm and go up to there and, and take this thing off and bring it in. Like I was you know, practicing the way I would steal this thing during the mission. <laughs> and uh so that's what i did you know and and uh i remember it really didn't go over my my crew thought it was funny but our instructor was kind of mad because i didn't let him on the joke he's like you're <laughs> supposed to be following the procedure blah, 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 blah. so i kind of got in a little trouble but that you know that i get chewed out all the time it wasn't that big of a deal so then what happened was is uh when it came time to do that during the mission of course i couldn't do that so i didn't actually go get it but it gave us a laugh and then when we when we were done with all of our training with hubble it was the final mission and they were taking the the mock-up apart and the, the the guys who worked on the mock-ups uh took that did took it off the, the uh took it off the mock-up and they all signed it it was a you know, big round piece of metal the, the the one on earth wasn't made out of gold it was made out of <laughs> lead or something that you could put in the water and they all signed it and gave it to me as a kind of a, a funny gift at the end so um yeah that actually is something i really treasure because i really loved working with those guys and it was kind of a, a fun thing to do to break up some of our training Nice. Okay, uh, this is a question uh, from David Cuniff uh, from Mike. How did it really feel to purposely destroy the handrail on the Hubble in order to gain access to the equipment bay? And is there any better uh, example of brute force exerted during a spacewalk even today? Yeah, I think... Uh, I, I, why is he assuming that was purposeful? <laughs> it was, It was. yeah. <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, Gary, we haven't talked about this yet, but you know, I got I I, I stripped a screw on one of our uh, on this hand drill needed to be removed to do this this repair on the on one of the instruments, and the solution was after not not we were trying to figure this out for a while, we didn't have a backup plan for this, and it was a very complicated spacewalk, but that was an easy thing to do, and that's of course the thing I messed up, and the solution was to just tear it off. So how I felt about it, I tell you, you know, I I, uh, I don't think Garrett heard this story, but. It, it required me to get up high on that. I get a little leverage on it, right, Garrett? I had to, you know, give it a little tug, and, you know, yank it off was the idea. And I went back in my mind to when I was ten years old, and I was throwing my, you know, my Spaulding against the stoop, you know, in New York where I grew up, you know, because no one to play with that day or whatever, which is pretty much the story of my childhood. But we'll save that for Doctor <laughs> Phil. So I'm just throwing a ball by, you know, playing by myself, you know, and and. And my uncle comes across the street. My uncle, you know, he had too much crap in his garage. So he worked on all of his cars out in the street. And he had this like 1976 Ford Torino. And he's cha trying to change you all. And he comes over and he's covered in like just you know, grease everywhere. And he goes, go. He didn't want to come in the house. I remember he's like, go get your father. So I go get my, go get my dad. And, and he, and he, and my dad disappears. And my dad grew up on a farm and he had these, these screwdrivers and his equipment for working on tractors. He had like the longest screwdriver I saw in my life. This thing was like six foot long. It was really, really, the long, maybe not six, but like three or four foot long. It was this gigantic screwdriver that they used on a tractor or something back in 1925. And he held on to this thing. He still had it. I don't know for what until that day I found out. So he comes out and he's carrying that and he's carrying like a, you know, a ball peen hammer. And he looks at me and he goes, Come across the street with me. Maybe you'll learn something. You're like one of those things, right? So what he does is my uncle couldn't get the oil filter off the car. When he put it on, he tightened it too much. He couldn't get the. He's like 
trying to smack it off and he got all covered with oil. My father goes in and hammers that hammer, the, the, uh, the screwdriver with the hammer into the, into the filter. So now he's got a filter, right? Garrett works on his car, so he understands this. And he's got a lever coming out of it, which is a screw, half of the screwdriver. Half's on the other side, half's the handles out this way. And he steps aside. And my uncle <laughs> grabs this thing with a rag and starts cursing and yanking and wham. And then, you know, and he loosened the, the, uh, the oil filter. So I tell you what, when it came, when that day came, I was in space and they gave me that solution. I got back into the airlock. You know, here we are, 350 miles above the earth billion dollar telescope and i grabbed that handle i l actually looked back at the planet and i said uncle frank this one's for you wow oh, so that's what nice. that's what was going through that's the way i felt about it and i was very glad when the thing ripped off that's, that's so awesome cool. yep that's an awesome story that's a great story there are more yeah. if you listen to our podcast that's only a small <laughs> yes. sample so this is from Brittany. uh who aka is a uh, future teacher in space she's on twitter and she does tweet you she was tweeting you this morning uh, mm -hmm. saying how much she loves the podcast <clears throat> and yeah, she I saw said, that. that was really nice Brittany. thank you yeah uh she said uh, y'all talk about uh, it's, i shouldn't do it when i'm english you'll talk about the uh your unconventional <laughs> route um to becoming shuttle astronauts uh not as test pilots like before and how you forge your own path Garrett also mentioned something about spooning Barbara Morgan. So I'm guessing he is familiar with her path to becoming an astronaut. Uh, in this new age of space with commercial spaceflight, what advice do you have for someone, possibly a teacher, looking to enter the aerospace industry or to be an astronaut or making her own path into space? Wow. Uh, well, thank you for listening, Brittany. We, pre we appreciate it. Uh, uh, given our listenership, every single one counts. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Um, let's see. I advice. Uh, I would say, um, you know, the, the, the standard advice I give people is like, well, basically don't give up. I mean, uh, it, it's if, if this is something that's important to you, don't let anybody tell you it can't be done. And keep plugging away. Be persistent and stick to it. And you never know. Um, the only way that uh, something that you really want to achieve is not going to happen is if you don't try. So, so give it everything you got, and 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 leave no regrets. And and um, uh, you know, obviously, if you want to become an astronaut or do something to contribute to space exploration, then then doing well and 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 becoming very knowledgeable about something in the STEM fields, whether that be engineering or physics or um, medicine, whatever it might be, uh, you know, do that. Uh, and, and then, and then, uh, and, and do something you're passionate about because nobody ever does anything that's really amazing. Uh, if they're doing something that they don't, that their heart's not in it, you know, nobody ever just goes to a 95 job cl clocks in and clocks out and changes the world. Uh, it just doesn't happen. So find something that you're very passionate about and then go for it. Nice. Anything to add, Mike? Uh, yeah, be, be, be ready, uh, because things change, you know, that as, as we mentioned, when, uh, when, when we were, when we were little and it was just test pilots, we would have never thought we could be qualified. And then, then it opened up to scientists and engineers, civilians like Garrett and I, and, and who knows what's going to, what's going to be in the future. There's, I think there's going to be a wide range of opportunities. And I think the best way to go about it is do, do what you love. You know, if you're a teacher, you mentioned, or whatever your occupation is, and you're interested in the space program, there's going to be a role for you somewhere. And I think the roles to actually fly in space are going to be opening up, and we can't even imagine what it's going to look like. With everything that's going on now, as you mentioned, with the privatization, commercialization, private astronaut missions, uh, there's all kinds of stuff going on there. So who knows what it's going to be like in 10 years. So don't don't ever feel like you're not qualified. Just keep, keep up you know, the faith and do what you love and, and stay interested and, and be ready. Amazing. Uh, that actually leads us on really nicely to the next question. Uh, this is from Lauren. Uh, with all the new activity going on in spaceflight right now, do you ever uh, want to call up the astronaut office and ask for your jobs back? <laughs> you know, I think they regret ever giving us our jobs in the first place. So <laughs> the chances yeah. are, <laughs> back are pretty low. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, you know, you do, obviously you miss it. It's, it's, it is the greatest job ever. And, and so, um, leaving was, it was a very difficult thing to do in a lot of ways. Um, so I, I, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's something that, uh, you, you, you always think that you would love to have another chance and, and, and to go back again. Uh, 
I'm not, I'm not, there are, there are some astronauts that come back and all they want to do is get back there and find a way to, to get back into space. I'm not really like that. I'm okay. If, if I never go back, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be satisfied. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty grateful for the opportunities I had, but, uh, but if somebody said, Hey, yeah, we need a commander for this dragon launch next week. Are you busy? I'd be like, yeah, I'll clear my <laughs> schedule. I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I kind of feel the same way about it. Uh, I'm grateful for what I had a chance to do. And uh, being a NASA astronaut is a lot of work too. You know, I was 18 years there and flew, uh, flew twice. Garrett <laughs> was there, I guess a little, how old are you there? About tw- uh, 14 years or so, Garrett? Or yeah, when did, 13. Yeah. 13 years and you yeah. flew twice, you know, so uh, I'm getting that right, right, buddy? Mm-hmm. Okay, so... Um, you know, there's, there's a lot to that job other than flying in space. Um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of things to, that you can do in life too, but now I've been out of there for seven years and I'd do almost do anything to go back. (laughs) 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 I really would, you know, I mean, I've had a great time and we enjoy the podcast and everything, but I would jump at the opportunity to go. If I thought it would work, yes, I would lobby to get my job back, but I don't, I know what that answer is going to be because, you know, there's other people there. But if there's ever an opportunity to fly on one of these private missions or a chance to go back, I would uh, I would jump at it. No, what? I, I, did, I, I did would. You, did you just say you would give up the podcast? <laughs> no, we do it from space. Oh, okay. And All I right. don't think it'd be a very long mission. You know, they only go up for <laughs> you know, the longest ones they're doing is a you know. If you, so you no, know, we do it from space. The podcasts would go on. Okay, it's our technology. <laughs> With our technology, we could do it from up there. Yeah, he's already got the title, the first person to tweet in space. Now he wants the first podcast in space. Come on, that's there where it's go. at. That's Ooh, where it's right. at. Right, that yeah. hasn't been See, done. The See, that's, yeah. how you, that's how you market it. That's how you start, yes. start the conversation. Mm-hmm. There it is. That's but good. the podcast must go on, Garrett. Yes. No matter where we are. Cost. <laughs> Look, you're in LA. I'm in New York. I'm not sure where these two are, but they're, where are you guys? London. Days in England? Yeah. You're in London. Emily, where are you? Uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. See wow. that? Ed, Ed space not that big of a deal. Yeah, yeah, it's closer. Yeah, it's, it's closer, closer than London. Yeah. It is closer. Yeah. <laughs> right now, it's easier to get to as well. But anyway, we've got one more question for you. This one is from Don Irwin. He said, I heard Mike speak of his Hubble experience, and during that story, he shared that he was given time to take in the amazing view during his spacewalk and seeing the Earth, the moon, and the stars, each by pointing his head in different direction. And it made him realize that the Earth was just one big spaceship. So Don asked if you could both describe that view from your spacewalks and tell us what it felt like to experience that view. Uh, I'll go first. I, I, th- I know Garrett has a good answer too, uh, but I'll, I'll, uh, you know, for me, it was I, I just felt like I was looking into paradise. I couldn't imagine any place being more beautiful than our planet. Um, you know, we've checked out the neighborhood. There's uh, there's no other options. You know, we need to take care of it and. Uh, I feel very, very lucky that we're here. And I think getting a chance to see it from that that vantage point has made me appreciate more the beauty of our planet around us all. You can see it everywhere. You can walk in, a, even in, in Manhattan, which we don't, you might not think of a very naturally beautiful place, but of course there is beauty to the buildings and the streets and the people and the motion. But there's also, you know, trees and parks and the river and the clouds and the sky. And it's just a beautiful place we live in. And, and we're very lucky to be here. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's, uh, the most incredible of all the experiences I think that Mike and I have, have been fortunate enough to have, I think that the very top of the list would have to be the, the spacewalks that we've done. And, and nothing really can prepare you for what it looks like. You know, you can look in VR headsets or, or um, you know, 3D movies and stuff like that, but, but it, it's just unreal. It's surreal when you see it with your own eyes. And uh, there are certain moments that uh, the thing, the other thing about spacewalking is that you're very busy and there's a lot of pressure on you. You're trying to stay on the timeline and get stuff done. And if you, you know, uh, you, you, you really want to be successful, you get a lot of people counting on you. This is a very expensive thing to do. And um, so, uh, but, but you do have to almost force yourself to stop and smell the roses once in a while. And we talked about this on the last podcast that we recorded, which won't air for probably another month or two. Uh, till we get to it, but uh, with my, uh, on my very last spacewalk, I had uh, a, 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 we had a chance to actually stop and, and soak it in a little bit. And I remember this one moment where I'm on the space station and I'm holding onto a handrail, and the entire space station is behind me, so I'm forward of pretty much the whole thing. So when I'm looking out straight ahead, I can't even see any other spacecraft. All I see is the Earth, 
and and the the sun was rising over the the horizon of the earth and so i watched this orbital sunrise and as the sun came up through the atmosphere of the earth and, and illuminated the entire planet uh and i'm standing i'm holding on to this handrail i'm kind of like uh, uh leo dicaprio and titanic you know like i'm king of the world like on the on the bow of the ship and uh and that view is just i can see it right now i mean that's a view that just burned into my memory and I'm very grateful to have that memory. It's a it's a wonderful memory. And that really is a great place to end. So thanks so much for joining us. Uh, the, the new podcast, Two Funny Astronauts, is available everywhere, and it comes out every week? Yeah, Weekly. Every week on, on Wednesday. Wednesday. Wednesdays, 5 p.m. Eastern time in the United States. Uh, I know we're all over the planet here, so but 5 p.m. Eastern, U.S. time, uh, every Wednesday. Nice. New episode. Yeah. Excellent. Right. And uh, on YouTube, you can actually see us. Uh, as well as hear us, but then also on Spotify, Apple, Google, uh, all the main platforms. Did I miss any? Podbean, Podbean. Yeah, we'll we'll make yeah. sure we share that links. But thank you yeah. so much for joining us, yeah. and uh, this yes, has been so much you. fun. My cheeks are hurting. So thank you so much no. for uh, for spending some time with us and answering our question and our listeners' questions as well. It really means a lot. Thanks for having us, great, Dave. The, Emily, thank you very much. It's a, a great being a guest on your podcast. Oh, this thank is, you. This has been really fun. <laughs> well, if you, awesome. anytime you want to come on, you just ask. Yeah, <laughs> doors really? always open. Yeah, absolutely. What about tomorrow? Yeah, fine, fine. <laughs> <laughs> it was magnificent. It's uh, great to work with the world going by and being out here with a good friend, Mike Good, is a pleasure. The real privilege to get to see what we're saying and get to work on this magnificent machine. Well, what'd you think about that? Uh, oh my god, I'm buzzing! Absolutely buzzing. They were so freaking cool. Like, uh, I think we heard a few stories that maybe we other people haven't heard yet. So that was pretty neat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was so open and willing to share. I, what what I really enjoyed, if you could feel the friendship between the two of them, when one of them was telling the story, the other one had a smile on his face and was enjoying listening. Uh, it it was just wonderful to see that process, and, and they just opened up to us and treated us like like we were one of them, which was just great as well. Like, like straight in with the with the jokes and uh, and and it was yeah, it was just wonderful, just wonderful. What great people they are. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, I, I really like their show a lot. I, I think it is funny. Uh, the Navy swim training part, the episode cracked me <laughs> yeah. up because, uh, yeah, I, I <laughs> obviously I got razzed a little bit from bringing that up but because I'm not a great <laughs> swimmer. But, um, yeah, I, I could relate to every damn thing that they were talking about in that episode because I'm like, yeah, they're, that that is not a fun experience. It is, it's a little scary. So, yeah, more big yeah. ups to them for exposing that <laughs> for what it is. I want people to go and uh, to go and listen to it. So I'm not going to share the punchline of that survival episode. Uh, but I assure you, I laughed out loud for a long time uh, when Garrett finally said what he felt about um <laughs> about it it was really really did make me laugh so go go please do go and check out their podcast also i just want to give a shout out to our patrons who submitted some questions great questions yes. absolutely amazing questions so thank you uh, if you're on patreon don't forget we, i always get in contact and let you know who's coming up please do submit some questions and anyone else who wants to join up join us over there please do and obviously for those of you who don't like search engines we will post links to mike and garrett's social media pages and to their podcast all of that will go in our show notes which you can find on your within your podcast provider or on our website, spaceandthingspodcast.com. I have the fireflies. So I have to start this week's news section with an apology. No one called me out on this. I noticed when I was writing the show notes. Last week, I mentioned that United Launch Alliance launched a Centaur rocket. It was actually an Atlas V rocket, of which the upper stage is the Centaur. Easy mistake to make, clearly. <laughs> Anyway, I corrected it in the show notes if you read those. If anyone reads those, you would have noticed. Uh, but on to this week's news stories. At the point of recording, there have just been uh, two launches since our last recording. On Wednesday, May 19th, the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, or CASC, launched a Long March 4B rocket carrying the Haiyang 2D, or HY-2D satellite, which is a marine remote sensing satellite. 
And on Saturday, May 22nd, Virgin Galactic launched their Spaceship 2 space plane, the VSS Unity, on a suborbital test flight to specifically test their systems to have passengers on board as they are trying to get their license for passenger flights. Yeah, there have been some wonderful videos from this launch, and uh, they've apparently got up over 600 paid-up customers waiting to go. So we say this every week now, but it really feels like space tourism definitely has arrived. And talking of that, the auction that we mentioned a few weeks back for the final seat on the first crewed flight of Blue Origin's new Shepard rocket, which is taking place in July, has now reached $2.6 million. <laughs> And with that in mind, it feels like a good point to ask you uh, <laughs> that if you'd like to sign up to our Patreon or buy a pin or a T-shirt, it'd be very much appreciated. <laughs> yeah, two point six million—that's not a lot. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah we'll uh, have to. We may have to get some more stock to raise that much money, but still, pocket change. Um, <laughs> elsewhere, <laughs> elsewhere, <laughs> we've had photos from China's Zhirong uh, Mars rover. They're in black and white, but they're still really cool photos. So we'll put them up on our website. Uh, talking of pretty things, by this time the podcast airs, we would have seen a Super Flower Blood Moon Eclipse. Uh, this is not the name <laughs> of another movie in the Twilight series. Um, sounds like a perfume or something. Like, <laughs> yeah. But it's still very pretty, so we hope you, some of you get to see that. Yeah, me too. Uh, these things are always pretty special, aren't they? I might go out and see it. Yeah, do, do it. It's not going to be over here annoyingly, but... Uh... I'm looking forward to the photos. I'm sure there'll be some beautiful photos online. Oh, yeah. And finally, Firefly Aerospace has announced that it will launch its Blue Ghost moon lander in 2023 on top of a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Firefly are an aerospace company in Austin, Texas. They haven't actually launched anything yet, although they are hoping to begin testing their own rockets for small satellite launches very soon. However, the company has been pitching their designs for lunar landers for a while, and in February they were awarded a $93.3 million contract to deliver Blue Ghost to the moon for NASA. Suddenly that $2.6 million for one seat seems very cheap. <laughs> anyway, the, the mission will carry 10 different payloads to the moon, which will be sending back plenty of scientific data from the surface of the moon. And I think that gets you all up to date with this week's news. And even though there are no time limits on podcast, we are out of time for today. Thank you very much for tuning in, and we hope that you enjoyed the interview with Mike and Garrett as much as we did. Don't forget to help us out by clicking that share button. It really does mean a lot, and keep your ratings and reviews coming in as well. Yeah, that would be delightful. Uh, episode 40 next week. Wow. 40 weeks of doing this. I can't quite believe it. Me, that's anyway, crazy. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening. And remember, in space, no one can hear you stream. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.